your coming is indicative of your priorities. May worship on Sunday morning a priority. I hope you made the Lord's Day a special day that you uh, treat differently than the rest of the week. And uh, we have come to worship Him. We're going to sing. We're going to uh, perhaps give some words of praise. And we're going to petition God for many needs this morning. But we want to focus on Him and His Word. And let's just do our best to shut out the distractions and let Him come and speak to our hearts. Let us stand together for prayer. We thank you, our Father, for the privilege that we have of coming to your house to be among your people, to worship you. And we know that we have lived in your presence through this week, but we thank you for these special times when we meet together with God's people in your house at an appointed time. Help us, Lord, to truly worship you. Help us to turn aside all those thoughts that would detour us from really putting our heart into this service. And we will bless your name for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Randy will lead us in song. Remain standing, please. Get a course book. Turn to page uh, 26 there, 102. God is so good. Your God good this morning? Amen. Amen. Amen.
trust that's your prayer this morning. Amen. 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 No desire to stay. Amen. Where doubts arise and fears just fade. Aren't you glad as Christians we can get above that? Amen. Praise His precious name. Amen. Turn to 382. He keeps me singing. Amen. We'll live victorious. He'll keep the song in our heart. Praise His name. stand up here and they can look you over and say, okay, here, here, here. Uh, I can't do that. I don't know you well enough yet. And as a, not a pastor, perhaps it's not my business to know everything that our pastors know. But I can at least welcome everybody. Wednesday night in the service, I was mentioning all the people that were missing and I neglected to mention there were about four or five of the Wilson children that weren't here Wednesday night, but I think they're back. And they're glad to, uh, glad to have them in the service. And I noticed that one of them has a birthday. Wow. Uh, 
is there anybody who likes birthdays? <laughs> all, all the kids. <laughs> That's great. All the kids do. And Tim. Tim likes them. Uh, how, okay. how many are at least happy with your birthdays? <laughs> now, a few more. That's, some of you I'm not sure. Good. We want to sing happy birthday. All right. Who is Madeline? Right there in Madeline, we're going to sing happy birthday to you and hope you have a good one, all right? Happy birthday to you. Creek, Pennsylvania this morning. I heard good reports out of the camp and I think it was maybe Thursday that I had a text communication with Brother Stetler and he said something like this. He said, uh, well I know, I wrote to him and told him what happened in our Wednesday night service. I told him about the songs that we sang and who testified and what my little message was about and he wrote back and thanked me for the update and then he said, Please pray for me. I preach tonight on holiness and the message is weighing heavily on my heart, which is, as it ought to be at least once in a while, a preacher ought to feel something. We don't always feel the same thing. But anyhow, the next morning he wrote, and he said, I thank God. Let me tell you what happened last night. He said, right after the song service, we had an altar service. An uh, altar filled with people praying and seeking the Lord. And uh, that continued till 8.15 when they finally turned it over to me. And he said, I told the, the congregation about Brother Egan's sanctified experience. And he said, the altar filled again with people coming to seek the Lord. Now, you, you like to hear about God moving, amen, and people moving. And one of the reasons I'm not... You know, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but one of the reasons when I'm up front, I sometimes ask people to come to the front to pray, like during the service while we're having our congregational prayer time, is because I believe that when God's people move any ways near God, it opens the door for God to move in other ways. And so when God moves, I want to be right in the middle of that movement understanding what he's trying to do. So, as we pray, let's pray for the Strouds and the Steckers as they minister today at Penn's Creek. For those of you who have been there, Sunday night is always, last Sunday night is always a, a big night because they have the Lebanon Valley Gospel Band uh, that comes and plays in the pre-service. And uh, boy, those people just uh, blow their trombones and beat their drums and uh, they have a, have a great time. So that's what's happen. Tonight also, this is uh, the last day of Josh's internship at Beavertown, which I'm assuming explains why uh, that family is not with us this morning. But we congratulate Josh and trust that God will continue to guide his life. That's the intent of the uh, announcement here, that we pray for uh, God's direction in his life. So let's remember that as we pray today. There are youth camps going on camp meetings. My home camp at Stoneboro starts here in a day or so. Interesting that they have a camp meeting that begins on Tuesday and ends on the following, the next Thursday. They only have one Sunday. And as I understand it, the reason why they did that, in years past, Brother Van Warmer felt that, uh, you know, Stoneboro has been a praying camp. Um, little groups of people all over the campground, districts and groups meeting together in dormitories and rooms and that kind of thing for years. 
and uh, they carried a load, they carried a burden, and it impacted the camp. Well, then on Friday night, and Saturday, and Sunday, people from surrounding churches came in. They hadn't been praying for the camp, and Brother Van Wormer felt that it was actually a drag rather than a help. So they scheduled it from Tuesday through the following Thursday, and uh, still a great camp. Let's pray for them as they begin their camp meeting here just in a few days. I'm trying to think, I know uh, David, Brother Black is one of the evangelists. Joe Smith is there as the Bible teacher. Uh, so let's remember the camp meeting at Stoneboro and many, many others as well. Esther Beyer returns from Honduras uh, August the 3rd here in a couple of days. Remember the Winkler's family situation. Brother Loper also is closing out a camp meeting tonight. Where is? Uh, Illinois. Oh, camp. okay. Mode camp? Wow. Anybody here been to Mode camp? Well, that's, a, that's an unusual camp. And uh, Brother Loper is there. Let's pray as he closes out tonight. Uh, the Stettlers and the Strouds, Pennsylvania. Uh, the cancer needs are listed there. The physical needs are listed there. I understand that uh, Kayla had a uh, scan this week, and we've been asked to pray for her, that God's hand will be upon her, and um, pray for our community, the extended family of our church, where there are uh, spiritual needs that, after all, ought to be the, the main focus uh, of a Sunday morning service, to pray for those who have spiritual needs. Our missionary families, I love it, the fact that we pray every Sunday for our missionaries, and I trust that we will do so again this morning. I would like to do what our pastors do and ask for requests, uh, but I still am not sure enough that I'm going to be able to hear, so I'm not going to do that uh, because it might be embarrassing for you, it might be embarrassing for me, all right? If you have those requests, take them to the Lord in prayer. Let's stand together, please, and join me, please. Please join me in prayer. Lift with me. It helps the prayer to go higher when all of us lift together at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful this morning that we have the opportunity of humbling ourselves in thy presence to give thee praise and honor and worship and glory. We're so glad, Lord, that we have the opportunity of magnifying the name of Jesus of honoring the Holy Spirit, of reverencing our Heavenly Father, uh, the great three in one. We give thee glory and praise this morning. We thank you for the Lord's Day. We thank you for a day that has been set aside in particular for us to join together our voices, our prayers, our fellowship as we wait in your presence for whatever thou dost have for us today. We thank you, Lord, for this past week, what we have sensed of your presence, thy help in the Wednesday night service. And again, Lord, in our personal lives, in our family lives, we thank you for every blessing. We thank you for protection. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the overshadowing wings of our Heavenly Father. How grateful we are. Now today, Lord, here's a little group of your people. We have not come by mistake. We have not come under pressure. We have come because we want to be here. We want to be in your presence. We want your presence. We want you to work in our hearts and in our midst. And so we pray this morning, Lord, that as we come into the time and the place of prayer, that your spirit will settle down. You know, Lord, the request that might have been made out of our congregation tonight, uh, today. We pray for every one of those needs, family needs and financial needs and, and psychological needs and emotional needs, all kinds of needs, even in this congregation. But we're so glad this morning that our Father in heaven knows all about that, now that our Lord Jesus Christ is touched with the feeling of our infirmities and knows all about us as our great high priest. We thank you for that today. We ask the Lord for these needs that have been mentioned. We... <coughs> We think especially of our pastoral families. We pray for brother and sister Stroud and their children as they provide uh, song leadership and music uh, for the last day of Penn's Creek Camp. And we pray, Lord, for the evangelists. We pray for Brother Stetler as he closes out the camp tonight, that you'll anoint him with your spirit, that you'll give him wisdom, that you'll give him, Lord, that, uh, that thumb in his back that he needs to preach effectively and do your work all through the day today. 
We pray with, for Josh today as he concludes his internship at the uh, Beaver Town Church. Make it, a, make it a great day for this young man, not only this day, uh, but the life that is before him. We pray that you guide him and lead him in the way that you want him to go. We know, Lord, that you have a plan for him as you have a path for every one of us today, and we thank you for it. We pray, Lord, that your hand will be in our own congregation, perhaps even here this morning. There are those with spiritual needs. Dear Father in heaven, I pray that right now the Holy Spirit will come. We welcome you. We welcome you. We urge you, Holy Spirit, that you will come and that you'll settle down upon my heart and upon our hearts. Lord, may we feel your presence. May we welcome your presence. And we pray that you'll do your work in every heart. Perhaps there's a backslider, someone who one time walked with God and has walked away and somewhere out in the wilds, out on the wilderness, wandering away. Dear Lord, may the Spirit of God go out there and touch that man, touch that woman, and draw them back to yourself. And we pray, Lord, for every believer, every one of us, Lord, needs your help along the pathway of life as we seek to climb higher, as we sang a few moments ago. Lord, we pray for every need that is represented, knowing uh, that you have the resources to meet every one of them. Yes. We thank you for that today. Now, Lord, we commit ourselves, we commit this service into your care. In Jesus' name, for his sake we pray. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Just before the service started, and the instrumentalists were playing, I guess one of my all-time favorite songs, uh, they were playing the, the song that has the chorus, I will praise him, I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain. I want to sing, pick up on that chorus at least, and uh, sing that because uh, I think it's appropriate always for us to give praise to him. Amen? And this is a good time to do it. Let's sing together. I will praise him. to the Lord and you can stand right now and let us know what's in your heart. Anybody like that? Just a word to praise the Lord.
just that quickly disappears. <laughs> that I thought would make a good song. But thank you, Mary, for that testimony. And we are praying for Chad and trust that you'll continue to remember this young man who has been through so much that God will continue to touch him. Thank you. Anyone else? A word of praise for the Lord. And it doesn't cost you anything. Yes. Uh, I would like to praise the Lord. I would just like to praise him because he's someone we can actually go to and, well, he's our only real protection and strength. And in this world, it's going upside down crazy. It's good that we have at least one source that's always there, one source that's never changing Amen. and actually capable of doing stuff, actually capable of anything he so desires. And if things don't go how we like, it's good to know that this world is not the end. He takes a bit more extra control in the next one. Even. <laughs> but the, there are so many challenges. This, the whole world and even in personal stuff, it never goes quite how you think. And it is very troublesome and during sometimes. But it is a comfort to know that he's there. Amen. He does care. Amen. Thank the Lord. And he is there. I've been singing this morning, Oh, happy day uh, when Jesus came and washed my sins away. And we walk with him and we find out that he goes with us all the way. Anyone else? Good testimony this morning. Brother Cooper. I'm glad this week that I've been able to go to the Lord to pray. Amen. Praise his name because he hears, he answers, and whether it's and whether it's a really big need or not so big, but bigger than us, he is adequate. He is able, and he is willing to just yes, undertake for us. I praise his name. Amen. Thank the Lord. Anyone else? Good. Amen. I like that. All right. Amen. I'm glad he does too. Thank the Lord. Anyone else? I love our children testifying, and they kind of give us a picture of what we used to call popcorn testimony when they jump to their feet and uh, back down before you hardly know that they're up. I see a hand back there. I can't tell who it is. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Good testimonies, and I appreciate it. After all, it is uh, fitting for God's people to give praise to Him. Amen? Yes. I thank you. Congratulate them. It's a wonderful state to enter into to be a great grandparent. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yes. I'm glad that God is always with us. <laughs> Amen. Boy, I love it. Anyone else? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I, I've never been explosive in my life. <laughs> yes. Yes, things that once thought impossible are possible with God. Praise the Lord. Hey, got any river to say we're impossible? God specializes in things thought impossible. Praise the Lord. Anyone else? I love the testimonies. They brighten the atmosphere. Amen. All right. If not, let me quickly remind you of a couple of things. Number one, uh, this typically would be the time of receiving offerings. And even after more than a year or so, Sill Street seems strange not to be taking offering, but we still take your offering. Sorry, we just take them in a different way. So remember the plates that are out in the uh, in the foyer. You're giving, from what I understand, has been outstanding, and I appreciate it so very, very much. And trust that you will continue to support the program of Burlington Bible Church. Tonight's offering is the missions offering. And of course, that rings a bell in my heart. Anything for missions, I'm in favor of it. And we have good missionaries that we're supporting. 
So think about your missionary offering tonight. I might mention that right now, uh, Mark and Melody are working with the Society of Indian Missions, and uh, he is holding kind of pastoral uh, conferences with the different missionaries out in South Dakota. And uh, so let's continue to remember the society. We don't particularly uh, support them, but we certainly ought to with our prayers. They're doing a great work. The sixth, coming up here, special day for Scott and Caitlin. Let's remember them as they come to their, their wedding date, building fund offering next Sunday in the PM service. The 15th is a baptismal service. If you're interested in being baptized, make sure you talk to one of our, one of our pastors about that. All right, I think that takes, oh yeah, there's that also Josh and Sarah's wedding comes up on the September 10th. If you want to put that into your calendar, make sure you keep that in mind. I'm sure that they would uh, enjoy their presence at their wedding coming up. We do have a special song this morning. And Brandon not only helps us in our song meeting, but once in a while he blesses us with his uh, special song. And I'm asking Brother Randy to come and bring us that message and song right now. God bless you.
better or higher desire uh, than to have the desire to live for him. Thank you so much, Brother Staley, for singing for us this morning. It's kind of a joy for uh, two ancients uh, to be with, no, let's call, let's call us elders, all right? <laughs> kind of nice for two elders to be uh, working together in this uh, in the service this morning and again uh, again tonight and last Wednesday. Uh, it's, uh, I said ancients, but uh, the biblical term maybe is closer to elders, so it's nice to have Elder Lonnie Witt to uh, speak for us this morning. I trust your heart will be open. Let's see what God has for us as Brother Witt comes to minister the word of the Lord. I don't know how to follow that up. <laughs> I really didn't know I was old until I got to Kentucky. <laughs> Someone started to talk about old people. And it's because there was already a young brother Witt in the house. So now I'm senior brother Witt. And by the way, Brother Sankey was around a few days before I arrived on this earth. <laughs> don't rub that in too much, but. Thank God for uh, good friends like the saints. I don't want to uh, make a mistake and try to uh, recognize everybody who is a visitor, but uh, the Arnders are here this morning. They are following weddings this summer, and, uh, and uh, they're here for Scott and Kaylin's wedding. And uh, we're also glad to have Bill Lee and a granddaughter. Uh, with us this morning. I think Janet said it was his daughter, and I kept I kept thinking, I don't know why he would have his daughter with him, but uh, it's possible. But uh, we've known Bill for a long time, many years, and uh, we're glad to have him today. I am going to uh, deal with a great big question this morning. You can read that question in six places, or at least four places of the Bible, and, and uh, the same wording appears in a couple of other places. But this question is, uh, I'm reading it from Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 6. And um, I will read the whole verse, but you will find the question right in the center of the verse. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? What is man? Let's ask the Lord to help us once again. We thank you, our Father, for this opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we know that we are here by divine appointment and that you have put us just where we are so that we can glorify you. Help us as we look at this question today that we will uh, feel drawn to you and feel valued as individuals who serve God. In your name we pray. Amen. I would like to say at the outset that I am not a science teacher. I think the last time I taught science was in the third grade. I mean, I wasn't the third grade, but I had third grade students. So I'm not a science teacher, but I've drawn a, a number of things from a book by Dr. Richard Swenson entitled More Than Meets the Eye. You should read the book. It's a good book. The question, what is man, is a very big question. It's obvious that this is not a question for God. God knows what man is. Um, God knows your chemistry. In fact, God could tell you that you have 10 to the 28th power of atoms. Now, I don't really know for sure what that means, except it means 10 with 28 zeros behind it, if you can imagine that. 
Uh, he could tell you that the human body is a million times more complex than the universe. Um, each cell of our bodies is unimaginably <coughs> complex. Each lives in its own community with its surrounding neighbors, uh, doing its own specialized work for the whole. And each cell is surrounded by a membrane thinner than a spider's web that uh, must function precisely or that cell will die. It's interesting that those, uh, each cell generates its own electric field, which is many at times larger than the field near a high voltage power line. I'm trying to get you to know that we are something of God's uh, great creative power. God can give you the reading of your DNA, which makes you who you are. Within that DNA, there are 200 different kinds of tissue and organ cells. And within each cell, there are chromosomes that are tightly coiled and encoded with the DNA that determines who you are. It determines your eye color long before you're born and whether you're going to be dominantly right-handed or left-handed. It tells what your shoe size will be. And uh, it tells whether you're at risk for a premature disease. It, yet each of those cells weighs two millionths of a million of an ounce. I don't even know how to figure that out. You don't have a scale like that, I know. The, the combined initial single cell DNA of every person alive today, assuming there are six million, I think a billion, the population is higher than that, but it would weigh one thousandth of an ounce for the entire world. What is the man? That is a very big question with an even bigger answer. First of all, we need to remember that man is favored. Man is the highest order of creation. Could I emphasize that? Man is the highest order of creation. I'm going to use some scripture that you've read and heard many times, but I just want to emphasize some points. Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. So God created man in his own image. The image of God created he, him, Male and female, not 27 varieties of genders. Um, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And then... 2 7 says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. I don't know if you have an imagination like me or not, but I have a very big imagination. Sometimes I have read books, and then somebody wanted to show me a film clip of this book. Or something, and I thought I'm very disappointed. My imagination's far better than that. <laughs> but I, I like to think about God sitting down somewhere under a tree and getting the soft red earth and and forming a man. And uh, you can almost see his artistry at work. And I think it was really just like that. And he breathed into him. 
the breath of life. And what did we read? We are to have dominion over this whole earth, all the creatures, all the animal life, the sea life, and all of that. Uh, some people in our society have a little problem with that. Uh, some people are very strong that uh, we are not to have dominion. Uh, I'm not advertising for these people. You may guess why in just a little bit, but PETA, the people for the ethical treatment of animals, uh, their motto is animals are not ours to eat, wear, experiment on, or use for entertainment or abuse in any way. Did you have sausage for breakfast? You want to come to the altar and pray? I, no, you don't. But we're to have dominion over the creation. I don't think we're to abuse animals, by the way. I don't happen to believe that myself. But we are to have dominion. You know, saving whales and the snail darter and other endangered species has may have some noble uh, and wonderful uh, thoughts in it and some merit, but man is still the highest order of creation. Man has been charged with the responsibility of subduing and dominating all animal life. And that again was restated after the flood in Genesis 9. I don't think I'll read that to you. But I want to make this point very strongly. We're the highest order of creation. It makes us responsible for a lot of things. First of all, we need to remember this, we're favored because man has the capacity to reason. Uh, the human brain holds 10 to the 14th power of bits of information in the brain. The brain can hold information that uh, could be contained in 25 million books. Enough to fill a library shelf 500 miles long. I think I may be several hundred miles short of that. But, <laughs> but the brain has that capacity. And the Library of Congress has only 17 million volumes. Think what God has given us as a capacity. That's probably why some of us as teachers have hammered and said, you can do this. We're telling students, you can do this. And that's true in most instances that we can do far more than we really do. So man has the capacity to re of reason. Man has sensory capacity. Uh, four or five weeks after conception, pain receptors appear around the mouth, followed by nerve fibers, which carry stimuli to the brain just four to five weeks after conception. By 18 weeks, pain receptors have appeared throughout the whole body. And going back just a little bit, in the sixth week, the unborn child responds to the first touch at six weeks. Man has the capacity for sensory perception. At 20 weeks, the fetal brain has the full component of brain cells that are present in adult life and are ready and waiting to receive pain signals from the body. It's interesting, we go beyond the womb and, and uh, just the sense of touch is is interesting. This is from Richard Swenson. The sense of touch incorporates many distinct elements. Pressure, pain, heat, cold, touch. And the body has 450 touch cells per square inch of skin. Skin, skin would you believe? And um, we can detect a smooth pl plane of glass from an etched plane of glass, if that etching is only one 
2,500 of an inch deep. I can't read those kind of numbers. I didn't ever do those fractions in school. And we can feel the pressure on their fingertips or face that depresses just a microscopic point zero 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 four of an inch. God has made a wonderful machine. It's interesting that we can detect the difference between a letter weighing one and a fourth ounces and one weighing one and a half ounces. Just by can we have a former letter carrier here, he probably can tell us that. But we cannot distinguish between 10 pounds and 10 and fourth pounds. There, the difference needs to be 2% for us to detect it. God made a wonderful machine. God, had man, God made man with the capacity to feel emotion. And you may have had many emotions already this morning before you got to church and here in the service. But we could list a whole number of emotions that we can feel, affection, aggression, ambivalence, anxiety, boredom, confusion, envy, embarrassment. We could go on and on. Many, many different emotions that we have. Human emotions certainly can affect us physiologically. And our physiology can affect our emotions as well. You know, sometimes when you're just overloaded with anxiety, you find yourself in pain or misery without much explanation. Read S.I. McMillan's book, None of These Diseases, and you will see a strong relationship between anxiety and our physical health. A fourth thing, and this, is, this puts us in a far different realm than any other of God's creation, but man has the capacity to worship. Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. There was a bond of fellowship there. God has created us with a God-shaped void in our hearts which only He can fill. And too often, people go through life trying to fill that void with illicit pleasure or greed or pride. They enthrone the creature in place of the Creator and they end up being miserable. St. Augustine expressed this thought in one of his confessions. Our hearts were made for you, O Lord, and they can never rest until they rest in you. Just consider the following. Though the mountains are majestic reminders of God's power, they are there because God put them there. And though the brooks sing songs of praise to God, they run their courses because of God's predetermined plan. The birds that sing while you take your morning walk at dawn, they sing those songs because God pre-programmed the music in their little hearts, heads. Man, uh, when he worships, he does it out of his heart. And when we worship, we can experience divine nearness, which may be inexplicable. When we worship, we should, uh, we should, in the manner as we should, I want to say, we are lost in God if we worship as He wants us to worship. And really, time doesn't matter when we're really worshiping God. And worship, though, does not mean that we have forgotten our reasoning powers nor abandoned modesty. Those who worship the golden calf had abandoned their sensibilities and their decency. But when we worship, we worship with reason. If, and we all have, if we think about it, have had times of great 
nearness to God and how it so lifted us that we had no desire to move from where we were to any other place. God came near. And he still does. Thank God that we have the capacity to worship. I want to mention something else about man. What is man? Man is flawed. Man has fallen, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5, 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. It is true that we are sinners by birth because of we are the sons of Adam, we are sinners. But it is also true that we're sinners by our own choice. We can, uh, we can do like the little child did when uh, the mother found the child coloring on the wallpaper with a crayon, adding to the beauty of the home, you know. Mom said, why did you do that? The devil told me to do it. Well, we make our own choices. Man is fallen, and we know that. Man is fallible. Because uh, man is fallen, he has a propensity to sin. And uh, we in the holiness tradition talk about acts of sin, and we talk about the nature of sin. And biblically, we understand the the uh, inner propensity to sin is the carnal nature. And uh, the carnal nature or that inward state is distinct from outward sin. But it's a thing that creates a problem in our lives. And that nature of inward sin is, is the cause of universal sinfulness of conduct. The inward nature of sin has to be distinguished also from, from other things that happen. We are subject to the fall. And I'm kind of getting off my subject just a little bit there, but we all carry problems because Adam fell. And uh, that is far different than a moral defect. You, Infirmities may uh, entail regret and humiliation, but sin produces guilt, and sin involves moral choices. We may feel very badly for what we have dealt with in our life, health-wise or in other frames, but we don't carry guilt. We may be sorry, but we don't carry guilt. Man is uh, also fragile. And in a sense, I've alluded to this, but the strongest among us can be felled by something so small that only a microscope can detect it. The very strongest. We may think that we're uh, able to overcome anything and something comes along that we could never see with our own eye. And we find ourselves taken down by it. We're constantly in contact with germs which are capable of bringing us to our deaths. I'm not going to live in fear, by the way. Um, I have a distant cousin whose name is Coulter. I don't really know whether he's even alive at this point. He was, when he was at age 15, he was diagnosed with an advanced stage of chronic Lyme disease and for almost five years of he had a constant and inexplicable sickness he was practically bedridden with a very severe pain and ringing in his ears and blurred vision and numbness in his arms and legs and none of the medications that Coulter took did anything to relieve his pain. Man is foul. 
Coulter had to drop out of school because he had been awake all night for two whole months of his life. Lyme disease, something we couldn't see. We are very fragile. And uh, something very small can be the end of us. Man is fragile also not, phys not only physically, but in some other ways, in the emotional sense. I, I am referring to an author who is not a Christian author, but Dave Peltzer has written a number of books about his childhood. You don't want to read the book if you don't have a strong stomach. But his own biological mother chose him out of four children chose to abuse him in so many cruel and torturous ways. He was uh, damaged emotionally in a very great sense. You can't read a book like that without feeling righteously indignant towards somebody who would choose to treat a child in such a horrible way. Some time ago I read a book written by Brother Smuel. It was entitled Forgiving Love. I don't have a copy of it. I happened to be somewhere where someone had one and I read the whole book while I was there. But he told of many individuals who suffered greatly because of the emotional trauma of abuse. Brother Smuel said that he was thankful he did not know until he was 59 years old that his own biological mother had given him up, left him on the doorstep of the couple who raised him. Abuse. We had an acquaintance, her name was Enola. She lived somewhere in Ohio, as far as I know. But she was aborted by her own physician grandfather who performed an abortion on his own daughter. Baby Enola was taken out to the dumpster back of the hospital in Huntington, West Virginia, and thrown into the dumpster. A nurse was leaving work that day and she heard a cry. She thought perhaps there was a cat in the dumpster and she felt compelled to look and found a little bundle. It was Enola, still alive. And she took her and she saw to it that she had a good home. That happened in 1940. Man is very fragile. We should thank God that he has brought us to where we are, no matter what your history is. It's another thing that we need to remember about man and his fallen condition, he's foolish. Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And many deny that God exists. We some way know how to deal with that better than some other varieties of that resistance to God. But many just say there isn't any God. But many live as though God does not exist without reference to God. Many live as though God doesn't really know enough to lead their lives or redeem their souls. I hope I've made enough of a case at the beginning of my message to let you know that God has every reason to be in control of our lives, every cell of our body, all as a part of his great design and he knows us better than we know ourselves and we can totally trust him. But we need to remember that man is foolish often and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We need to remember as well that there is neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He's the only, the only answer to our needs. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness. Do you really think you can run your own life? God, who numbers the very hairs of your head, is able to give you a life full of meaning and full of, of value to yourself and to those around you. The God who knows us so well was willing to give his only begotten son that, uh, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank God for Thank God for it. The man is so foolish. But there's a third thing I want to mention to you this morning, and that is that man is free. You know, God didn't make two robots in the Garden of Eden. He didn't make two robots that would do just what he said with his remote device. But he gave mankind free choice. You and I are free. You are free to waste your life or to let it be managed by the one who knows you better than you know yourself. And we can be saved and sanctified and still need to be reminded that God wants to work in our lives to keep us from doing the foolish things that our head might tell us to do when our heart wouldn't. Can I give an illustration? I remember something that happened on the mission field, and I'm getting old enough, I repeat myself, if I told the story before, just write it up. can't remember. We had a lady in a, in a church where we were doing a pastoral work as missionary pastors, and I worked so hard with this young man to get him to come to church. And he finally came. And on Wednesday night, dear Sister Smith stood up and she put her hand on her hip. You know what that stance means? I know what it means. I was in trouble when my mother did that even before she said anything. Trouble was coming. Sister Smith put her hand on her hip. She turned toward him and said, you young people. And started reading the riot act to young people. I was a young missionary, really young. Probably younger than, than people thought missionaries ought to be sent. I don't suppose I was much more than 24. And I didn't know what to do with those situations. But I suddenly thought, this would be a good time to sing the chorus right in the middle of a testimony. <laughs> and I started a chorus, but it was too late because the damage was done. He never, ever, ever set foot in the church ever again. He was friendly to me. He was kind to me. He esteemed me, but he never came back. But you know, when that happened, something happened in my heart. I think it was the right thing, really. I was really, really upset because I thought I had worked so hard to get this young man to come to church. And a lot of times there weren't a lot of young men coming to church. And I thought, oh, thank God he's here. You know what I was going to do the very next... I didn't say it that night, thank God. But the very next morning, I was going to take care of the situation. You know, you've had that urge to do that. I'm sure I was tugging at my sleeve, something like my mother-in-law would have done if she was getting ready to attack something. Bless her memory. But I was just doing that, going to the door, put my hand on the door handle, and the Lord said, wait. Wait. If I'd have been running my own life, I would have thought, well, something, there's something wrong with that signal. I'm just going to go ahead and do what I know I need to do. But the Lord said, wait. In fact, he said, you need to pray and you need to fast for three days. I don't think I could do that right now. The 
fasting part. You think, I look like it, but I can't. But I did that. And then I went. And then I spoke. And I think I said many of the very things I would have said if I'd have said it that very day that I had my hand on the door. No. But my heart was in a better condition. And I think the Lord had spoken to my head a lot better. And we need to remember that even as saved and sanctified people that even have gray hair in our head, we need to have God's guidance. But we're free to make a mistake if we really want to. And we usually uh, get a whipping for it. We're free. You know, you're free to reject or to be redeemed. You are free to deny or accept. You're free to choose damnation or eternal life. People say, I don't think God will send anyone to hell. It seems like something I read in scripture goes pretty strong. Depart, I know you not but it's based on the choice of what an individual makes. You're really free to do what you want. The Christian religion is really not about turning us into cookie cutter people that all look alike and all move alike, but it is about surrender to Jesus Christ and the Christian religion is, is not really about religion, it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ and we do what we do because we want to please him. And we're not restricted by a whole lot of man-made rules, but rather the, the whole desire just to please our dear Lord and Savior. I'm about to finish this message, but I would remind you of the story about the funeral procession for the great missionary David Livingston. It was said that it was the greatest procession that London has ever seen. In the great throng, a shabbily dressed bum fought his way through the crowd to see the procession go by. He was rebuked by the crowd, but he cried out, I have to see David Livingston. I know him better than any of you. We were in Sunday school together. He decided for Christ. I decided against him. The question is, what have you decided? Have you decided to allow the all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present, all-loving God to redeem you and make you a fit instrument for his service and glory? Or have you decided to run your own show, to do your own thing, to live it your own way? It's an important decision to consider. And maybe I'm preaching to the choir and maybe there's nobody here who has any inkling of a need in your life. But let me tell you, if you know that there's something in your heart, his power can make you what you ought to be. His, his uh, life in your life will give you victory and peace and hope and help. Shall we stand together, please? I would like us to bow our heads. I would like to just ask this question. Do you have a spiritual need that you're aware of in your life and you would like to have prayer? And you would like to at least acknowledge by an uplifted hand, I need God's help right now in my life. I see that hand. Are there others? He can give you the victory you desire. Let us pray. We thank you, our Father, that you have been with us this day. We thank you, Lord, that you have made us and that you have uh, come to make provision, dear Lord, that we can have life and have it more abundant. We ask now that you will bless each individual here in divine presence. Presence, bless the one who lifted the hand, help with the need of that life, we pray. 
We pray that you will help us all to go out of here um, encouraged in you, knowing that you care about us as individuals. And we will praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen.